In this section, we are going to talk about trace elements that we test for in the human body. Just as an introduction, um, we are going to discuss the difference between essential and non-essential trace elements. Essential trace elements are considered essential if a deficiency impairs a biochemical or functional process and replacement of the element corrects the impairment. So this is something that we need to have in our diet. For example, we have the essential and non-essential amino acids. When we talk about proteins and such, these are elements that we need to have. Usually they're associated with some type of an enzyme or another protein or some type of an essential component or cofactor. The trace elements are found in such small quantities in the human body that we use milligrams per liter, not milligrams per deciliter. So there's a lot less of it than other things that we test for. Examples of the trace elements might be iron, copper, and zinc. Ultra trace are extremely small, small amounts in the human body, less than micrograms per liter. So tiny, tiny, tiny little amounts in a liter. Milligrams are small, but micrograms are even smaller. Examples might be selenium, chromium, and manganese. While they are in ultra trace ele uh, elements, we still need them in our diet. Then we have the non-essential trace elements. These are only of medical interest because many of them are toxic. And I'm sure as we go through this, you'll recognize a few that you may have heard in the news or from watching medical mysteries or mystery diagnosis or something like that. Okay, let's look at the sample collection and processing of these trace elements and ultra trace elements. The specimens must be collected with extreme attention to detail. They have to use certain anticoagulants, um, certain collection apparatuses, and have a special sample type. The navy blue top tube, for example, you see one in the bottom right hand side of your screen, is a tube that was created in an environment with a special type of glass that we know does not contain ultra trace elements in it. Sometimes when um, you make glass, glass is made out of silica or sand, I believe, you can find some of those ultra trace elements just in the glass, and we wouldn't want those to leach out into the patient sample and create uh, something that would be inaccurate. So these blue top tubes are made specifically for trace and ultra trace elements. Some of them have EDTA in them, some of them don't have anything in them. So you could get either a serum or a plasma sample. It just depends on the laboratory that is doing the testing and what they require. With these types of samples, they are subject to contamination by the environment. So when the research or in the laboratory, reference laboratory opens the tube, they do have to be very careful not to contaminate those specimens. We do use special um, collection devices, specially cleaned glassware, and water and reagents of super high purity when processing these specimens. The laboratory environment where this testing is done is very carefully controlled. They usually have um, uh, sticky mats at the door, non-shedding ceiling tiles, controlled airflow, and disposable booties to make sure any dust particles that could potentially have those elements in it could fall in your sample because it could affect the results. All right, couple types of instrumentation that we use when testing for these. We already talked about some of these um, in chemistry one with uh, how the instrumentation works. So when it comes to the trace elements, know that atomic emission spectroscopy and atomic absorption spectroscopy are the two types used to test for these. Um, just a little review of your atomic emission spectroscopy. Um, we use a light source, okay, which is a flame. The light is emitted through a monochromator, and then we have a detector on the other side. Usually a liquid sample containing the element, such as the patient sample, is converted into an aerosol and delivered to the source where it re receives some type of um, energy to emit that radiation. That radiation is then um, detected on the other side. The other one was atomic absorption spectroscopy. Um, we did talk about this briefly in uh, the first week of chemistry one as well. And this is also a procedure for quantitating those elements. And you see the difference with atomic absorption from atomic emission is you see there's a light that shines through that flame, okay? So we do have um, that additional piece there. 
So the light source, which emits a spectrum of the analyte, an atomizer, which is where the flame is that you can see down on the bottom here, and that then the light shines through that goes through the monochromator with a detector on the other side. So the two types, what you really need to know of instrumentation used for trace elements, atomic emission spectroscopy and atomic absorption spectroscopy. Let's move on to the really interesting fun stuff, arsenic. Arsenic is non-essential, it's toxic. If you've ever heard of arsenic before, you probably refer to it as some type of a poison. It is ingested usually in your food. It can be found in small quantities in seafood. It can be found in water, drinks, you can inhale it. It's relatively tasteless. So that's why this works fairly well to, um, for rat poison, because you can put it in their food and it kills them really easily. I remember watching a um, mystery diagnosis and there was this guy who was on his deathbed and he'd gotten progressively sick and doctors could not figure out what is wrong with him. Well, it turns out at the end when they went back and looked at everything, his wife was adding arsenic to his iced tea, I think it was. And I watched this a while ago, so I don't know if I'm, I'm off on this or not. But added it to his iced tea so he slowly got sick over time. He would end up in the hospital. I think he was having some seizures. Um, you know, different things were going on with him. And I think one of the doctors, if I remember correctly, recognized this leukonychia in his fingernails. So they're looking at the fingernails, and I know I have some white spots on my fingernails too. I'm pretty sure it's not arsenic, but um, that is one of the things that they might see in a patient, which could cause them to, to go this direction. If you're not specifically testing for arsenic, um, it's hard to detect any other way. So you can have acute or chronic um, intoxication. The inorganic form produces symptoms and can be lethal, and organic species can be non-toxic. So there's two different types of this. It's the inorganic that is lethal. Interesting stuff. Cadmium. This we find in things like lithium cadmium batteries, for example, which I have in the bottom right hand side in the picture there. Um, these are non-essential and are toxic in the human body. We can become exposed in tobacco smoke or it could be ingested in food if food was contaminated. We absorb, um, 10 to 15% of it is usually inhaled, 5% through the GI, and uh, we excrete it through the feces if we are exposed. The toxicity of cadmium causes severe renal dysfunction. We can also see nasal epithelial and lung damage and respiratory distress if it is inhaled. In uh, great amounts, we see nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and you'll see the nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain in quite a few of these if it becomes in a high enough amount. All right, the, uh, my picture kind of got cut off a little bit here. I'll see if I can cut, bring it down. Um, lead, you see on the top left-hand side, that is chipping paint on the side of a house. This is non-essential. It's toxic in the human body. And when I think of lead, I think of all of the children and babies that I would draw blood on when I worked in a clinic um, for lead testing. I think all of my children, I have three kids, they were all tested about around age two for potential lead poisoning. Now, they always ask you the age of your home. If your house was uh, built at a certain time, it may have lead paint. Kids like to chew on um, anything they can get their, their mouth on, right? Because they're teething. So if it's a windowsill, if it's the side of an old crib, things like that can cause a lot of um, issues with this when they ingest it. Usually the exposure is respiratory or gastrointestinal, in the case of those children chewing on the paint chips or picking the paint chips up off the ground, putting the dirt in their mouth. Um, that would be the GI type of uh, exposure. What happens in the body is it binds to proteins and it changes the structure and function of those proteins, including many enzymes, okay? So it'll inhibit enzymes which are necessary. In children, we see IQ issues. They may do poorly in school, for example. They may have difficulty walking and gait issues, which is kind of like a clumsy walking. They could get a headache, have behavior changes, seizures, cognitive and behavior problems. In adults, it goes, it's you know, in the, involved with the brain as well. We have peripheral, peripheral neuropathies, which means your hands may have sensitivities or not work very well. Motor weakness, difficulty picking things up, um, just being overall muscles being weak. 
renal insufficiency, problems with blood pressure, and anemia. With lead poisoning, and we're going to tie in hematology here, which most of you, not all of you, are maybe in hematology class as well, you see this basophilic stippling down in this red cell. Okay, it looks like a speckled, purple speckled type of red cell. That happens with lead poisoning. All right, mercury is our next one. These are, this is non-essential and toxic as well. When it comes to understanding these different toxic or different elements, know whether they're toxic or essential. Very important. This one, definitely toxic. I remember as a child um, playing with mercury. You would break thermometers or if the thermometer would break, or your teacher would have it, or we had games that actually had mercury in it. You'd take it out, you'd play with it. It was heavy, it felt kind of wet. Um, you play with it in your hands. Nowadays, you will not find mercury in that type of environment anymore. It is, um, it is toxic. You can inhale it or ingest it in fish. Um, you can get it cutaneously through your hands. In your tattoo pigments, I don't think they have it in there anymore, but they used to. And you, if you have any silver fillings in your mouth, those actually contain mercury. 80% of it's usually inhaled. 0% um, doesn't really get involved through the GI, it can go through the skin. It's usually excreted through the feces and the urinary tract. It is toxic because of the reaction it has with sulfhydryl groups in the body. It can cause tremors, tachycardia, which is a fast heart rate, and those renal issues again. The inhaled vapors usually cause nervous system, digestive system, immune system issues. And inorganic salts um, found can be put on the skin or the eyes, GI tract, and cause kidney problems. Moving on to some of your more essential types of trace elements. First one is chromium. And I put the picture of chromium picolinate in the top right hand corner um, because that's how I have seen it in stores. Why we might want to take chromium picolinate is to support our metabolism, especially glucose, along with fat and cholesterol. If you are a type 2 diabetic, this might be something that the doctors would um, like you to take to help with that glucose metabolism. Absorption, transport, transport, and excretion. It's usually absorbed and bound to transferrin, transported by albumin. A deficiency can cause glucose intolerance. So you could get high glucose levels. You could have glucose in your urine, which is glycosuria. It can cause um, hypercholesterolemia, decreased longevity, decreased sperm counts, and impaired fertility. So having a deficiency can be quite, um, quite a problem. If you take too much, it could cause dermatitis, skin ulcers, and eczema, airway irritation, and lung cancer if it's inhaled. Next one here is copper. This one is essential. It is a component of several enzymes. Usually we ingest it in our food and we need it. Um, it's usually 50-80% uh, of it is through our diet and um, we do excrete it through our feces, urine, and sweat. With this one, while we do need it for enzymatic reactions, um, if we don't have enough, it could cause neutropenia, which is a decrease in white cells, hypochromic anemia, osteoporosis in our bones, decreased pigmentation of the skin, or general pallor, which is just being pale. Toxicity, on the other hand, is, um, can cause Wilson's disease. And I think we talked about this when, um, with the proteins when we talked about ceruloplasmin, which carries copper. But if you have too much, it can cause Wilson's disease, which causes these Kaiser Fleischer rings um, around the outer cornea of the eye here. You can see the, the copper ring in this person's eye. All right, our next one, which is a really big one, it not only um, is involved with chemistry, but also a really big role in hematology. So if you're in hematology this quarter as well, you will learn um, a lot about iron and how it's used in the formation of hemoglobin, which is needed to make a red blood cell. So iron is stored in a couple, uh, it's, there's a couple different states. We have the Fe plus three and the Fe plus two. Iron equals Fe on the periodic table. So that's where the Fe comes from. It's stored in the Fe plus two or the ferrous state so it can be absorbed, and it's physically active in hemoglobin. A couple tests that we do, one of them is called the total iron binding capacity. We will do this in lab um, this week, or the week that you are going over um, 
the iron and iron binding. So the amount of iron that can be bound by saturating transferrin, because transferrin carries iron, and other minor iron binding proteins present in the serum or plasma sample. So the iron binding capacity is very important. It's also important to know that the transferrin binds ferric iron, okay? So we see the physically active Fe plus two in hemoglobin, but ferritin, or transferrin, binds Fe plus three we find that increased in iron deficiency anemia. We see low iron with an increased total iron binding capacity in anemia. That is extremely important to know. Okay, so low iron with an increased TIBC in anemia. Um, it is an essential component because we need it for hemoglobin and myoglobin. But if we do um, get too much of it, it can become toxic. So deficiency would cause anemia. Toxicity is um, tissue accumulation, uh, liver function, hyperpigmentation. If you have too much, it's referred to as hemochromatosis. I have a little uh, picture here on the bottom right-hand side of the difference between ferrous and ferric. Okay, I always think of my children. If there's two of us, they get along just great. If you throw a third kid in the mix, it's icky. Fair ick is three kids, fair us is two, two of us. So it helps you memorize which one's ferrous and which one's fair ick. Our next trace element is manganese. This is another essential component of metalloenzymes and is also an enzyme activator. Uh, this one, the absorption is affected by iron, calcium, phosphates, and fiber, so we need to make sure we have the appropriate um, nu nutrients available to us to absorb this. Deficiency, we see blood clotting defects, um, low cholesterol, dermatitis or skin issues, heart problems, and stunted growth in children. And if it becomes toxic, once again, I said this happens with a lot of these trace elements, nausea, vomiting, headache, etc. This one kind of cracks me up because of the compulsive laughing or crying. So they may present to the physician with compulsive laughing or crying. Next one, molybdenum. This is an essential component of at least three enzymes. Um, a deficiency can cause seizures and lens dislocation, decreased brain weight if they don't have enough of it prior to age one. Toxicity is usually rare. It's hard to get too much of this in your diet, but it could cause elevated uric acid and gout. Next one, selenium. This one is also essential. This one is part of a cellular antioxidant defense system against free radicals, also involved with the metabolism of thyroid hormones. So with selenium, um, it could help prevent against things like cancer because it fights off those free radicals that can cause those gene mutations. Um, we can become exposed in our food or drinking water. A deficiency could cause cardiomyopathy, heart issues, muscle weakness, and osteoarthritis. Toxicity is relatively rare, but again, would cause nausea, vomiting, etc. Zinc, uh, it is essential. It influences greater than 300 enzymes in the body. It synthesizes and metabolizes proteins. It participates in glycolysis and cholesterol metabolism. Very important guy. Uh, we absorb them through our food. A deficiency can cause growth retardation, slow skeletal maturation, testicular atrophy, and reduced taste perception. Toxicity can cause GI tract symptoms and decreased heme synthesis. So we do need that for heme synthesis as well. Okay, so some people are just deficient in many, a few things. Now think of people that maybe uh, have anorexia that are not getting the proper nutrients into their body. There may be other issues causing um, a nutritional deficiency. It could be a GI disorder such as Crohn's disease or some other type of absorption problem. Usually, um, not, when we do see comp things called pica, it's from one of those types of problems. So a severe nutritional deficiency um, could cause somebody to start eating non-food items. Now you see this guy chewing on his keyboard, that's probably not very common, 
But some common things um, that we do see are children that eat dirt. Um, they may want to chew on ice. There's people that may want to eat cornstarch or there's just all kinds of non-food items. It can be caused by um, poor diet, malnutrition, food deprivation, mental retardation, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Some complications of having pica are malnutrition, lead poisoning, and iron deficiency anemia. So just a little end note there of pica. If you look up YouTube videos on pica, it's very interesting to see um, some people's real life stories with that. This concludes my section on trace elements. Thank you.